Welcome to The Launch, the podcast sponsored by Tandem Launch, Canada's premier incubator. We'll talk about tech, startups, entrepreneurship, fundraising, and everything in between. If you have a research background in tech and always wanted to build your own startup, then check out our website, tandemlaunch.com, to see what we're all about. Now on with the show. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Launch Podcast, sponsored by Tanum Launch. I'm your host, Bobby Bedochka, and joining me today is CEO of Hyla, Derek Hewn. Thank you so much for being here, Derek. Well, thanks for having me, Bobby. It's awesome to be a part of this. So you have had a very interesting career trajectory. Um, your story is, is really, really interesting. So um, tell us a bit about how you got where you were, where you are, and yeah, so just go for it. No, thanks. I, you know, I, there was no plan, Bobby, you know, to be totally honest with you, right? I mean, I'm an engineer and I was just incredibly lucky. You know, I, I think that I was able to connect with a bunch of mentors and folks that I, you know, got a chance to work with that, you know, kind of gave me a passion for uh, technology and, you know, how technology can evolve. Um, I, you know, I, I joined a small company that was acquired a number, you know, a number of times by larger and larger companies in the telecom space. And I got to see how a small entity changes as, you know, the, the larger uh, company, you know, kind of takes over, you know, one of the company I was, companies I was with had over a hundred thousand employees and it was just such a different experience. I grew up, you know, moving from product management uh, after, after engineering to being in the office of the chief technology officer and, uh, you know, working on trying to relate some of the cool new tech that was coming out of the research teams uh, you know, to customers and how how we could potentially get customers excited about it. Um, after telecom, I got a chance to work with an amazing team that was part of, you know, a company in the embedded computing space. Um, and that gave me exposure to new markets that I had never seen before, you know, automotive and aerospace and defense activities, med tech companies. Um, and, you know, even some of the early IoT days, uh, as, as well as, uh, you know, tech that was, that was happening, uh, you know, in, in terms of wireless communication and, and how the wireless communication would change things. Um, all of those pieces fell together in a way that, you know, gave me these opportunities. And I'm just so thankful that I was able to have amazing mentors um, and, and uh, you know, uh, work with really, really talented team members that, uh, uh, you know, we did some cool stuff. I mean, you were there in the early days of telecom, right? So really, you know, near the beginning. So like what, just tell us a bit about what it was like then. And like, I mean, it's changed so much. It, it, it certainly has. And, you know, I don't think of myself as that old, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I, I, you know, I, I was, Back when telecom of, was cool. <laughs> <laughs> I was part of telecom when we were talking about broadband and, you know, how are we going to get high speed internet homes? Right. And uh, being a part of that and then seeing that same excitement morph to wireless broadband, how are we going to get more content to people's devices? I think the, those, challenges were, were, were such an amazing time. Um, and, you know, I, I remember on the wireless broadband side, you know, a lot of the discussion was always about the use case. You know, why do people need high-speed internet to their home? I mean, you know, they can do, you know, dial-up internet, but, you know, people didn't think beyond what they knew. And I really always tried to find a way uh, to work with really talented people to help us imagine what was possible beyond what we knew. Um, with wireline broadband and broadband to the home, I mean, one of the big drivers that I was so passionate about was content. You know, I thought for sure content would change from traditional cable and satellite and, and, and you know, what we knew uh, with a converter on the top of the TV to something where it was completely on demand. And it was a weird time, right? I mean, there was friction in the industry. You know, there were people in that industry didn't want to see any changes happen whatsoever. And I have tons of stories. Um, but, you know, we, we, we developed technology as a sort of community of engineers around the world that enabled that 
to happen. And that, you know, almost the exact same happen, thing happened with mobile devices, right? Uh, you know, we were using, you know, amps and CDMA and then 3G came and, you know, we started talking about what if you could like consume content on your device and Bobby, people just, they, they couldn't think of it. I mean, the device display was so small. They thought, why would I do that? But we talked about, hey, this will change, you know, and, and it will become a thing. And, and there was always a, a bunch of folks that didn't believe it would become a thing. Um, so, you know, those challenges and kind of building ways in which you could suspend disbelief and how the technology would enable these use cases were a passion uh, of mine. You know, it didn't feel like going to work. I, I, I had the opportunity to work with people where I just, I couldn't wait to actually, you know, get there and figure out how we were going to do these things next. And, you know, that kind of just evolved beyond that, you know, to the point where we were starting to talk about how, you know, vehicles could be connected, right? And, you know, you saw things like General Motors OnStar come out and, and you know, where could we take that? Does it, does it mean that every vehicle could be, t- could be connected? What, what does that mean for the actual driver and the passengers? Uh, you know, now we take for granted that you go to the dealership and you buy a car that is connected and people buy vehicles based on the app that allows them to actually understand the vehicle. You know, I want to start it when it's cold. I want to understand how much gas is left. And I mean, it's just, it's amazing how that's all changed. And uh, being a part of some of the early days, especially with some of those really, really talented people I got a chance to work with um, was just an amazing experience. Gosh, I'm just thinking back 20 years ago when I, I was one of the first people that had um, a cell phone um, you know, with, within my group and, you know, it was the very, very initial one with just the, the gray, like DOS looking kind of screen and, sure. and re- remembering like that dial up noise. <laughs> <laughs> I would give anything to hear that right now. I just, it's just, it's so funny how it's, it's all, it's laughable, um, at this point, but yeah, I remember even, um, you know, back then, 20 years ago, when when you were getting dial up and 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 people were thinking, oh, okay, well, I can project this to my TV, and I'm saying like, soon you're going to be able to like, we're going to be able to talk on the phone through video and stuff, and they're like, ah, that's never going to. It's like a hundred years away. <laughs> yeah, right. So exactly. Funny. I mean, it it. it it, you know, there were early projects, you probably remember them, right? Some of these things that sat on your desk that were supposed to be, you know, video conferencing projects. And, you know, you think about it with what we've all just gone through over the last couple of years. I mean, we weren't really using these kinds of video conferencing tools in the way that we do now. They're just normal now, right? They kind of help our ability to connect with people around the world and not have to be uh, in the same spot. But I mean, it wasn't that long ago where we didn't do these kinds of things, right? And yeah. uh, I think people forget how fast sometimes the tech can change our behavior if it sort of embraces a use case that people need or it really resonates with them. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really incredible to think about it like that. Um, so I I really like you. You have this intrinsic ideation quality about you, which I think is really groovy. Um, and I don't think that, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm like an ideas person in my brain. It's like popcorn. Um, and so, but I don't think enough people are like that. Um, and so if, you know, because in order to sort of move these ideas forward and be able to imagine these possibilities when, it, you know, other people don't, if someone wants to foster that type of approach, like, how do you, how do you do that? Like, how do you think about it? How would you, if you were going to instruct someone or advise them or inspire them to think like that? It's, it's like, how do you tell someone to imagine something they can't imagine? It's a great question. And, you know, over the years, uh, you know, I've, I've met people who are just naturally able to disconnect from the reality they know and sort of imagine the reality that they, that they want. And, you know, I'm not suggesting everything we came up with, you know, had any legs, right? I mean, there was very few that did, but um, I think just putting yourself in the position of, you know, the the consumer, you know, your kids, uh, you know, your nieces and nephews and what they're doing and and how they may, uh, you know, think of things in the future is always really helpful. You know, 
the product management process was something that always served me well. I had a gentleman I worked for early on in the telecom space, and he was like a professor. You know, he spent a lot of time with me making sure that I understood it is a stepwise process where you really have to understand the voice of customer, the voice of the consumer. You need to look at trends in the industry outside of what you're actually lo looking to, to build to see if what you're doing actually makes sense. And, you know, his words stuck with me my entire career. And I was able to, you know, I think hopefully share some of the knowledge he shared with me with others as I kind of grew to, you know, from junior product manager to product manager to product line manager to manager of product management um, and beyond. So um, I think that, you know, just getting people in a place where they can feel safe to kind of dream and think about what they would like to see um, and really encourage them to suspend what they know um, and come up with, well, you know, wouldn't that be cool? I mean, I remember once, Bobby, like, you know, we, we had this, this room that we were in with, that was covered in whiteboards. And, you know, we used, I don't know, like a, probably two or 300 packs of, you know, those uh, 3M, you know, post-it notes and stuck them on the whiteboard with a whole bunch of different ideas. Um, and then, you know, tried to draw different pictures to give everybody a sense for what people were passionate about. And like I said, I mean, a lot of the ideas were amazing and a lot of the ideas were, were out there, but it didn't matter, right? It was a safe spot where everybody could just bring what their particular passion was and, their, and, and kind of apply their experience. And it didn't matter if they were from sales, from engineering, from, you know, product management, uh, or, you know, if they were one of the researchers in the CTO office, they, they all had a voice. Um, and I think just, you know, trying to create that environment where people could, you know, dream, I, I think really made it work for me. Um, you know, we had conflict on occasion, I'll be honest with you, right? People would come up with things and, you know, we'd, we'd have folks kind of slam it down and, and certainly, you know, interacting with customers, that was reasonably regular, right? But um, I think just being able to absorb people's passion for things and and why they believe what they believe was was what kind of allowed us to, you know, move through it. And, uh, and, and in the end, you know, you, I don't know, for me, it was one of those things where I saw things coming together in a certain way. And, um, you know, I, I was able to convince, uh, you know, management on a couple of occasions to do things that were pricey and a little bit nuts, but they <laughs> said, okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll give you a shot, but it, it worked, you know, and I, I, maybe it's just l dumb luck. I don't know, Bobby, but it worked and, and people, it, it really resonated with people. You know, we brought, we brought cars to Mobile World Congress when there was no car. I mean, Mobile World Congress was all about, you know, and it, by the way, it's going on. Um, it was all about, uh, you know, cellular infrastructure and, and devices and things like that. And, I mean, th those kinds of new ideas, I, I really believe sort of, you know, fostered people's imagination about what might happen. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I know one thing I would really like is I'm just going to throw that out there for anybody who's listening. If I would like to download my thoughts somewhere. <laughs> so if I can, I have a thing. I will even take like I I'll do patient zero. I will take any if what cyborg me up, implant me, whatever. I have the coolest ideas and sometimes the visions like they're not in words. They're like I I I, I see like a little movie, and if I could just download that, that would be super efficient, and I would really like that if somebody would invent that. So um, you know, speaking of these really sort of out out there ideas, um, you once shared with me some stories about. I mean, it's one thing to for us to laugh back at at you know the 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 dial up noise, but thinking forward, you know, when you are throwing out new ideas um, of what could possibly be, most people's reactions is kind of like to laugh it off or to be like, "That's ridiculous." Um, so I think you have a few stories like that that you might be willing to share. I do. I, I do. I, I, it's hard to pick sometimes, right? Because some of the, and they, you know, I don't know about you, but some of these things were sort of inevitable for me. You know, they, they, 
they were, I don't know if they were challenges. I'm not sure I really can explain it, but uh, I got energy from the room that was not believers, uh, if that makes sense. Um, you know, I'll never forget. I had the chance, uh, you know, I worked at Alcatel Lucent, uh, a very large telecom company that was, you know, then purchased by Nokia now. Um, and I had the chance to serve um, on the board of the, um, the University of Southern California's Entertainment Technology Center and be surrounded by just amazing people, forward thinkers, uh, people from the entertainment industry, people from the telecom industry, people from just, you know, tech space. Um, and, you know, the CTOs of all the major studios. Uh, and on a couple of occasions, you know, we hosted certain events uh, for the content industry, especially the emerging content industry, uh, where there were just visionaries. Uh, you know, Jonathan Taplin, you know, founder of Entertainer, uh, you know, as, as a speaker and, and, and others that, that they were just so passionate about the fact that we were actually going to consume, you know, content uh, at home, not through cable or through, through satellite, but over the internet. And by the way, we'd also do it on mobile devices at some point. And, uh, you know, there were people like Bruce Eisen and, and you know, others, Amy Friedlander, uh, you know, Tyler Goldman, they, these, these folks were such visionaries in this particular space. And uh, I was asked a couple of times to, you know, talk about the technology to do this with, with folks. And, you know, in, in many circumstances, especially when larger telecom companies were involved in those discussions, there was disbelief or, or, or even laughter sometimes that we, this, we would ever get to this uh, point. By the way, I, please don't allow me to generalize, right? There were many believers within those organizations as well. But getting to them was sometimes tough because, uh, you know, they knew what they knew and they knew the expense related to actually build an infrastructure that could support this. I'll never forget. I asked uh, one of the team members that I worked with, Megan, uh, about whether or not she could build me a device uh, that we could use as a prop. And it ended up being a slab of plastic with a piece of glass in it that uh, we painted the back of the glass silver um, and the device or the, the piece of plastic was, you know, about the size of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Um, and like I said, it was, a, it was a piece of plastic with a piece of glass, nothing. And, you know, I brought this to meetings and I showed it to people saying, at some point you will use this as a notebook, as something that you will, you know, uh, use to, to, you know, view content on and, and stuff like that. And people were like, Derek, no, it's, you're just, you're a dreamer, you know? Um, and, you know, I still have that piece of plastic just because, I mean, it was years later, uh, you know, that, you know, we started to see slab phones and, and, and tablets come out and things like that. You know, again, please don't suggest uh, or think that I'm suggesting that, you know, I came up with that idea. I did not. I, I, I gleaned this from so many different inter interactions that I was having, but I wanted to hold something and show people, this is what you're going to actually use. And it, it helped. It really helped. You know, we, 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 we use that as a prop that I think got people thinking about what might be possible from a, from a telecom perspective. And, and you know, the, I mean, yeah, there was, there was so many examples like that, I think that were really, really amazing and, and sort of game changing for, for me. Yeah. I mean, that's why we need MVPs. People need to see something like it's, it's really hard, especially if you're talking about big dream types of things to have something that, at least you can wrap your head around. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah, that's brilliant. Ah, oh, I wish you would have brought it. You could whip that out. That would have been fun. <laughs> <laughs> I, can show, I can show you another time. Um, and so um, let's move the conversation over to Hyla. So you've recently taken on the post as CEO. So yeah. um, tell us what you y'all are working on over there. Yeah, I mean, the Hyla um, team is is amazing. I, I've been so uh, honored to you know have been asked to be a part of that that team. Uh, you know, Charlotte Savage is the is the founder, and I mean, she's just an, an amazing uh, person, very very passionate about technology for good, and finding ways in which to solve very complex problems. Um, Hyla is focused on very very low power RF communications, and using tech uh, and a, that that we know and understand, but applying it in a slightly different way. Uh, it's once again, one of these breakthrough technologies where 
we have to convince people that the physics of what they know don't necessarily have to be the future. Um, and it's, it's hard. It's not easy, right? Because uh, very, very low power wireless communications is something that people have said forever. Um, it's just that the way in which they think of what low power is differs, right? It just, it, it went from things that were here and then it was a little bit lower and then a little bit lower. And, you know, now we're approaching something that I think is mind blowing. Hyla's team has uh, built a, a, you know, a chip that actually, again, sus suspends disbelief that you can actually communicate at that particular power level. And this unlocks some amazing use cases, right? Um, the one that I'm most passionate about, and I think Charlotte shares this, is you could extend the battery life of wireless devices substantially. You know, we're always worried about, oh, we've got to go charge that. Or, you know, is that thing running out? Or we get a note in our app that says, hey, you know, Derek, you got to go and change those batteries because it's almost out. Um, so I think the, the Hyla solution has the ability to really, really lengthen how uh, batteries are used. And, you know, I think you'll agree, Bobby, right? It, it's, we're not having less wireless devices in our lives or in business. I mean, it's just, it's growing and growing and growing. And, you know, it doesn't really matter who you believe from, you know, the analyst community, whether it's, you know, Gartner, IDC, or, you know, BCC, or, you know, they, they all have different ideas of the rate at which wireless devices will, will continue to increase. It, I think we all believe, you know, it will over the next 20, 25 years, I mean, they will grow dramatically. Mm -hmm. But the amount of battery waste that comes with that growth is sort of an unintended consequence, right? Um, you, you think about it, I mean, you know, we're, we're already changing batteries all the time. And I don't know about you, but I mean, I, you know, I'm an engineer, so I've got my little Ziploc bag, I put my batteries in the Ziploc bag, and then I bring it to the disposal place. But I think, you know, most of uh, the world doesn't do that, unfortunately. Uh, things get chucked. And in an in industry, there are battery chemistries that are being used that offer long life, which is amazing, and, and that the performance is incredible, but they're not rechargeable. They're not really recyclable. I mean, they kind of end up as hazardous waste. And, and I think that's no longer cool. We need to do something about that. So Hylas technology has the ability to lengthen how long a battery lasts in a wireless device, which I think is number one, that's awesome. Smaller batteries, right? We don't necessarily need the big battery because it's so power efficient, we can have something that's much smaller. That starts to unlock a whole bunch of new use cases because you couldn't have something that small before. And then, you know, I'm really interested in some of the things that I see happening in academia. You know, they're, they're starting to talk about things that will help people um, uh, just with their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, you know, you mentioned like, you know, patient zero and implants and things like that. There's a lot of really, really good work happening in, in, in that space. And, uh, you know, those devices will need to communicate, but I don't know that we want to actually put batteries, you know, uh, with those things, right? We have to find a very power efficient way to do that. Excuse me. And that's how, that's how Charlotte founded the company, right? I mean, she uh, was in a situation at a med tech startup where she was looking for the lowest possible power profile. Um, and, and it was hard to find something that made sense in her mind. She had suspended disbelief. She saw a future that I think was, was something completely different. And I, I believe Hyla can play a role in actually shaping that future. Uh, the Hyla technology is adaptable to wireless protocols that exist today. It, it's not creating anything new or, or asking anybody to change their habits. It's, it's adapting to what's there, which I think is just ridiculously cool. Um, and I'd love to be a part of this team that actually uh, plays a role in moving this technology forward because I think it just has such a, a feel-good aspect to it, you know, reduction of battery waste, better sustainability. You know, we don't need as many adjacencies uh, from a networking perspective to actually have the same experiences. Um, all of those kinds of things, I think, really differentiate what Hyla is doing. And, and you know, building this team in Montreal uh, has been fun. I mean, you know, there's such talent uh, in, in, in Quebec and in Canada and the talent um, 
really wants to work at you know companies that I think have breakthrough uh, kind of technology. So we're 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 excited to be uh, part of that. Excellent. Well, Derek, I feel like you're right in your wheelhouse of working on a technology that requires um, conversion of some non-believers. So I think you're you're you know right in the right place there. <laughs> and I I mean I hate cables. They're so ugly. Um, but also I think that, you know, up until recently people in tech, you know, were just building their tech and not really thinking about the circular economy, right. Not thinking about where's this going to end up, um, you know, once it's finished and, and so, yeah, I'm a huge proponent of, of tech for good. And I mean, you have to think about it. it. It's part, it's, it's part of the process now because, um, especially, you know, the, the up and coming generations that they care about this. And um, yeah. these are, these are real, you know, having these values, company values and tech values um, is, is, is an important thing. Um, it's not just about building products and putting them out there and selling them anymore. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I share with folks all the time, Bobby. I mean, I was part of the problem. You know, I built numerous devices that used, uh, you know, wireless uh, battery chemistries that were, purpose built for a particular outcome and i didn't even give it a second thought what would happen to those batteries my bad uh i think the the hyla team and the, you know the investor team surrounding hyla has really helped me understand how you know that's not okay anymore and we, and we need to educate people about these choices and how you know some of this technology with some with some you know investment and help can uh, can really change that paradigm, which I think is incredibly exciting. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay, so then um, you have been in industry, in startups, so you kind of know both sides of the game. Um, I hear a lot from, say, recent grads and potential entrepreneurs that they sort of ha- hold this notion of, um, because of Tandem Launch, right, we're trying to encourage people to come and build startups with us. Absolutely. And and I, and I get a lot of... A, well, I feel like I need to go into industry for a couple of years first um, in order to get experience for startups. And not that I don't think going in, you know, getting a multitude of experiences isn't, isn't a good thing. It's definitely a good thing. But they somehow are connecting that when I go to industry, I'm going to be able to learn and, and then do a startup. So what are your thoughts on that? You know, I think uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting conundrum. Um, Folks that are in engineering or in other disciplines that uh, that have the sort of curiosity about uh, starting their own business, I think it's different today than it was when I graduated. Right? I don't remember incubators. I don't remember mentors as part of incubators like Tandem Launch that they even existed. Um, right? Exactly. It's 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 just it's a new paradigm now. You know, coming out of university, I started my own company. I failed. I just it didn't work out for me. Um, but then I went to a, uh, you know, a, a regular engineering firm, and I, you know, I kind of did the, you know, the the, the slog in the beginning. Um, now, you know, young people can come out of school, um, or even during school, they can have experiences that will help shape their careers. You know. Um, after I graduated in the 90s, you know, we started to see things like co-op happen. And, 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 you know, now I have, you know, family members that are very active doing internships and co-op to help try and shape where they're taking things. And, you know, my advice to them is get as broad a range experience as you possibly can, because you may love the passion and the excitement that comes with the startup lifestyle. And you may learn things that you wouldn't get a chance to learn if you went to a large industry. Uh, I think there's, there's, there's pros and cons on both sides all the time. But the one thing that I've learned is that if you want to be an entrepreneur now, you will have support to actually make that happen. Um, universities are building accelerators. Uh, they are building startup competitions. Industry is building startup competitions. Uh, and these startup competitions can help you raise enough capital to be able to test your idea and see if there is uh, a community of, of folks that will actually support you getting where you want to go. Um, 
The other thing is that there are all kinds of ideas in academia that need entrepreneurs to take them to the next step. And I think that, you know, what Tandem Launch offers is the ability to actually make that bridge, you know, between amazing, you know, technical, uh, uh, you know, groups of people and those people that just de- really want to actually make that bridge happen and create a company uh, out, out of it. Uh, that's amazing. So, I mean, not everybody wants to be an entrepreneur and, and I'm not suggesting it's, it's an easy thing to be right. Uh, mm-hmm. I learned the hardware hard way. It's, it's, it's tough, you know? Um, and, but I can tell you that, you know, you, you, you learn from those experiences and it takes you places that will, I think, really govern your career going forward. So I, I, I love that there's so much more access to entrepreneurship, uh, access to business people that want to share their experiences. Uh, you know, um, uh, Hylas founder Charlotte speaks a lot about the Dobson Cup at McGill and how, uh, you know, it gave her access to people that she never knew she could actually have access to. She learned from, you know, interactions with uh, VPs of engineering, CTOs, CEOs, CFOs about all kinds of things. Um, and I think that's just amazing. I hope my kids get the chance to actually experience something like that too, Bobby. I, I think it's game changing. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, so I'm trying out a new question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of random and I'm just gonna see you know, how it goes. So we're gonna, we're gonna try it here. Um, what is your favorite movie or show and favorite book and why? Oh, okay. Goodness. Uh, favorite movie. Well, I mean, for me, you know, pretty much anything with Ben Stiller or Will Ferrell, uh, those guys make me laugh, Bobby, like, uh, you, you know, uh, Zoolander, uh, I, I honestly like, you know, I, I can't stop laughing. Um, and you know, I think one of the ones that I is all one of my all time favorites is the secret life of Walter Mitty that Ben Stiller did. I just, I love that film. It's, it's so well done. And I think it, it, it kind of has a, you know, a message and a theme in it uh, that, you know, with courage, you can actually have an amazing life experience. Um, and uh, I, I, anyways, I, I love it. So, yeah, I mean, those are, you know, pretty much any sort of, you know, spy or intrigue movie, you know, I, I think uh, those are always, you know, fun that you can turn your brain off for a bit and just, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, learn something new. I watched over the weekend Spencer, the sort of art film that was done by, about, you um, uh, Princess Diana and her experience okay. with the royal family. Oof. Definitely not one of my favorite films, but but interesting nonetheless. Mm-hmm. It certainly was a you know an open window to uh, a time that I had not, no understanding about. Favorite books? Um, well, right now uh, 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 Mendelssohn and Feld wrote Venture Deals. It's it's. <laughs> It's, it's certainly one of my favorite go-to uh, uh, books. They, I think they've done a wonderful job helping uh, folks in a tech startup uh, or really any startup just understand the process. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a great, it's a great book. But I think my, my all-time favorite, uh, the Harvard Business Review published a book on mental toughness. And mm. I think it's, it's, to me, it's, it's something that I, you know, I would definitely reread multiple times and I've recommended to many, many people. It's, it, it is an insightful uh, group of essentially articles that they've put together on exercises you can do as a person just to actually, you know, become more and more resilient. And I don't know about you, Bobby, but I mean, as I've uh, aged, I, I might have become a tiny bit more resilient. Uh, um, but sometimes, you know, these, these things that they, they, some light bulbs went off for me. So I, I love them. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's I think it's good practice to read books like that. I mean, there's always room for improvement, and sometimes you just need reminding um, too, so it just keeps you on task. Um, so it's called mental mental toughness. Mental yeah. toughness. Okay, so we'll put those in the show notes. Toughness for everybody. Yeah, and I mean your choice of movies and shows that definitely reflects. I mean, you're a fun guy, and the stories about being laughed at the underdog. So, I mean, it's, it makes a lot of sense. 
um, <laughs> that, that, that you love it. Just going to psychoanalyze you a little bit. Um, <laughs> so I also understand um, that Hyla right now you are currently fundraising. Um, so, you know, just for all the investors listening out there, tell us what you're looking for and how can people get in touch with you? Oh, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that opportunity. Um, you know, Hyla has, uh, as I mentioned, we, you know, we've been able to deliver that, that first experience, right? So, you know, our reference design is complete. Our chip is, is included in that reference design and, and we're out there road showing like crazy, trying to make sure that people um, see what, what's possible with the, the Hyla technology. Um, but building semiconductors uh, is uh, not an inexpensive, uh, you know, uh, sort of proposition. It, it takes it takes time and 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 you know, so amazingly talented people. Um, we're moving towards the second generation of our of our chip, and to do so, and uh, and I think grow the team to be able to do multiple adaptations to other radio protocols. Our first one, by the way, was adapted to Wi-Fi, but we would like to you know hit things like LoRaWAN and five G cellular and others. Um, you know, we, we want to grow the team and be able to grow uh, the the knowledge base around how to make this uh, make this happen. So we're 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 out there, uh, you know, speaking to folks, um, uh, you know, not just in Canada but also in the U.S. and and abroad about uh, whether or not they believe uh, in, uh, in 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 what Hila is doing and, and if they would consider supporting us. Uh, so we're uh, you know we're very lucky in that. Hyla was recognized by Sustainable Development Technology Canada with a fairly sizable grant. Um, and, uh, and that is, in, it, you know, I think, the diligence surrounding that grant uh, has given people confidence that the Hyla technology is, 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 is really worthwhile having a, having a look at. So, um, yeah, I mean, we can drop uh, you know my email address in the in the show notes if you'd like, uh, Bobby. But it's it, it's easy to get a hold of myself or or our founder Charlotte Savage, and uh, uh, you know uh, on the Hyla.io website, uh, you know you you can uh, throw an inquiry there as well. We look at those every day, and uh, it, we love the opportunity to connect with people that share our, our same passion. Excellent, great. Well, thank you so much, Derek, for joining us. It's my pleasure, Bobby. It was great to do this. And uh, thank you so much for uh, pulling together the launch. I, I, uh, I have loved being a part of today's session. Amazing. And thank you very much to our loyal listeners. Your time is always appreciated. If you are um, viewing this on YouTube, uh, please do hit the like button. Uh, throw your thoughts in the comment section. Subscribe. And you can also follow us on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So ciao for now. Thank you for listening. We hope you had fun and gained valuable insights. If you like what you see in here, hit the subscribe button, leave us a comment, share the podcast, and follow us on social media.